scripture for today comes from John 12, 12 to 16. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees. They went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, for it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. I want to invite you to imagine with me for a little bit. It's Jerusalem, the year 30-ish CE or A.D., now, Jerusalem at this point in time is an occupied territory. It's under the thumb of the greatest empire that has ever existed up until that point. The Roman Empire is this sprawling global force that attempts to dominate as many people and places as it possibly can. And the way that they do this is kind of interesting. That They go around and they take their giant military and they invade a particular place. They squash it and, and after that initial invasion... They don't necessarily try to micromanage everything. They kind of pull back a little bit and they install these regional rulers. Often they will get somebody from that place to be one of those rulers, those mid-level kind of people. They might allow a little bit of local government in the places that they conquer, but, but they also make it very clear exactly who is in charge. What's more, they demand a certain amount of allegiance to the Roman Empire in a couple of ways. The most obvious which of which is through taxes. Whatever you do, do not stop the tax money coming to Rome. However, on top of that, they also demand a certain kind of worship. See, the Roman Empire wasn't just about uh, a political thing. It was also a religious thing. The Romans worshipped a whole range of different gods. And among those gods, they worshipped Caesar, the king, as the Son of God, as a deity. And the thing was, if you were conquered by the Romans, they would let you keep worshiping your local God that you were used to, but in addition to that, you needed to add in Caesar as well. You had to bow down and worship Caesar. This, of course, was a bit of a problem, particularly for the Jews in Jerusalem. Now, yes, there were some people who wound up cooperating with the Romans to survive and to get along, uh, but that was actually kind of a sticking point among the Jewish community. For a lot of people, this was a problem on a whole bunch of levels. On one hand, see, it was true that, yes, the, the Jews had been occupied by a whole number of different people for the last three or 400 years or so. They, at one point, they were under the control of the Greeks and now the Romans. But the thing was, they still remembered the days when they were their own sovereign country, with their own king descended from the line of the great King David. And the thing was, they desperately longed for that again. They longed to have their own king, to be their own independent Jewish state. And there were actually several attempts at this, one of which was actually kind of successful. Just a few generations before Jesus lived, there was the Maccabean Revolt. A group of people called the Maccabees led this revolt that pushed out the Greeks for maybe 50, 60 years and for a short time established this independent country. Most importantly, and interestingly, when the Maccabees pushed them out in, that, in the text that records that story, it says that the Maccabees then went back to the temple in order to rededicate it, make it holy again, and they marched in with praise, waving palm branches, with harps and cymbals and stringed instruments and with hymns and songs because a great enemy had been defeated, crushed, and removed from Israel. See, the political occupation was a problem for the Jews, but so was this demand to worship Caesar as a god. The Romans worshipped many gods. 
But the Jews did not. For Jews, one of the central scriptures was Deuteronomy 6, which says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. The idea of bowing down and worshiping Caesar along with Yahweh, (laughs) that was an affront to the very nature of Judaism. Like I said, there were people who went along with this, but there were a lot who did not. There were numerous groups who tried to overthrow the Romans from time to time. It was a regular thing to have riots and upheavals on a fairly regular basis. Just 40 years after Jesus lived in 70 CE, let's not forget that the Romans had, came in and crushed another one of these upheavals so bad that they flattened the temple and destroyed it, which is how it remains until today. Things got interesting particularly when large groups of Jews got together, particularly when they got together in Jerusalem, which was considered the capital city and the center of Jewish worship, and particularly when they got together in Jerusalem during Passover. Because Passover, remember, Passover celebrates when Pharaoh overthrew, or when God overthrew Pharaoh in Egypt and freed the people from oppression from another great empire So many generations ago, a large group of people in Roman-occupied Jerusalem in 30 CE, during Passover, this was a powder keg waiting to go off. But the Romans, the Romans were not about to have any of that. That was not a thing that they wanted. They were going to remind people exactly who was in charge here. And let's not forget this. One of the big ways that they did that was with the Antonia Fortress. See, in Jerusalem, the temple was on uh, the eastern side of the town. And the temple itself was a rather large, uh, impressive structure. It was the size of six football fields or so. But right next to that, built right next to it, within a hundred years or so of Jesus coming, or Jesus being born, the Romans built this even bigger structure that towered 150 feet over the temple. It was a massive structure that housed an entire battalion of Roman soldiers looking down over the temple. It was an imposing thing. And make sure that you know exactly who is watching over you. The Romans wanted to have a constant reminder of the power and the might of the empire. On top of that, however, they would often use their military to reinforce the point. And they would do this by making a show of force as they would walk into or march into the streets of Jerusalem. On the west side of town was where uh, Pilate lived with his own little fortified barracks. Pilate was a local Roman leader, Roman ruler. And from time to time, they would march in from the west side of town when they needed to show off the power of the empire, like during Passover. When they needed to do that, they would have a good old-fashioned military parade. See, just west of Jerusalem was an entire legion of the Roman Empire stationed in the town of Emmaus. And you can imagine the scene pretty easily here, right? You have Pilate leading this procession on a big war horse in his full battle attire. And he's leading hundreds upon hundreds of soldiers armed to the teeth with the latest and greatest armor and weaponry. And as they march into town, they march in lockstep one after another so that as you watch this go by, you can feel the ground shake at the might of the military. There are trumpets blaring patriotic Roman hymns. There are banners with the face of Caesar emblazoned on it that says, Son of God, underneath all of it. This is a procession that would get the attention of people watching this. This, That was the point. This procession was designed to intimidate. It was designed to inspire awe and wonder to induce fear in anyone who would even think about saying a bad word about the empire. It was a show of force and domination that told people about the power of the empire and told them to bow down and worship Caesar, the divinely appointed Caesar. This is Rome's kingdom. Don't you ever forget. That's coming in from the west side of town. 
Then on the east side of town, coming from the Mount of Olives, you have a different procession led by Jesus. It's almost the, the opposite of that procession. You have Jesus walking and riding into town, not on a war horse like Pilate, but, but on a donkey, a humble, lowly animal. On one side of town, you have Pilate leaving hundreds and hundreds of soldiers, and on the other side, you've got this ragtag little band of disciples. On one side of town, you've got trumpets blaring all sorts of, of songs. And on the other side, you've got children cheering and laying down palm branches. On one side, you have the image of Caesar proclaimed as the Son of God. And on the other side, you have Jesus coming in and people shouting, Hosanna, which means save us, save us and calling Jesus the King, and calling Jesus the Son of God. Calling Him the King from the line of David. And they even quote the prophet Zechariah, which we have just a little bit of it in John, but the whole text, which people would have known, is much more striking. It says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your King comes to you, righteous and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations, from the sea to the sea, and from the river to the ends of earth. His rule will extend. Maybe if we were to imagine this kind of scene, this competing scene in today's world, we can imagine something like this. Our country is scheduled to have a military parade in Washington later this year. Imagine for a second, on one end of the National Mall, you have this military parade going through the streets, and on the end of the other end of the National Mall, you have this weird guy with a small group of people having their own kind of parade. On one end of the mall, you may see tanks rolling down the streets or soldiers marching in formation. <clears throat> and then on the other end, you've got this guy riding on a hay rack with jugglers and dancers hanging around him. On one end, you've got Secret Service crawling all over the place. And on the other hand, on the other end, you have children handing out flowers. On one side, you have bands playing patriotic music And on the other side, you have people singing Amazing Grace. On one side, you've got people saying the Pledge of Allegiance, standing next to the most powerful man in the world. And on the other side, you've got people holding up signs that say, Jesus for President. Now, some of you may here today may be a little taken aback by that image, may be a little shocked by that, but that's exactly the point. That's what it would have felt like for Jesus to do this in Jerusalem in that day. And that's the same kind of thing Jesus was doing with the Roman Empire. That's the same kind of edge that Jesus had riding into Jerusalem on that donkey with people cheering and shouting. In fact, that's the reason why in the Gospel of Luke, when he tells this story, he includes this scene where the Pharisees come up to him, these other Jewish people, and they say, hey, Jesus, tell your disciples to knock it off, man. Like, tell them to be quiet. You're going to get our heads chopped off. And Jesus says... If I told them to be quiet, the stones themselves would cry out. In some ways, the triumphal entry is a rather unsettling scene. But it's also a scene that is part of a much larger point that Jesus is making here. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus talks over and over again about the fact that he is coming to establish the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And in many ways, yeah, that kingdom can talk about sort of a contrast with the Jewish world. But it's also a very stark contrast with the Roman Empire. In fact, many of the words that we would associate with church or Christianity were words that originally applied to the Roman Empire. For example, the word kingdom, the word gospel, 
good news. The word Christ, or Messiah, the name Son of God. Ecclesia, which is the word for church itself. The title of Savior. The word faith. The word Emmanuel, or God with us. The whole concept of worship. And most importantly, the title of calling someone or something Lord. These were originally all things that applied not to Jesus, but to the Roman Empire, to Caesar, and to the worship and allegiance of both of those. Jesus and then his followers, the Christians afterwards, they came and take those terms and flip them upside down on their heads. Jesus' followers decide to join God's kingdom, not Caesar's. They confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and that Caesar is not. Jesus comes as king of a very, very different kind of empire. And the triumphal entry, and that's only the beginning of it. We see over the rest of Holy Week exactly what it means for Jesus and for everybody else to live in the kingdom of heaven. After Jesus rides into Jerusalem, he actually goes and confronts some of the Jewish leadership as well. He rides straight to the temple and throws out the money changers, the people who have corrupted the house of God, and he kicks them out. And then he proceeds to go and hang out and eat, eat supper and eat meals with all sorts of people that he should never even be in the same room with. At one point, he even allows a woman to anoint his feet in a way that broke every purity law that there was. And then, on Thursday night, Thursday night, Jesus eats a meal. He eats the final meal with his disciples, and he teaches them what it means to do what he does, to live in this new upside-down kingdom. And to make his point, Jesus, the leader and the teacher, he takes the position of the lowest person in the room, and he washes his own disciples' feet. He says, this is what it's all about. And then, on Good Friday, we get the pinnacle. With the backdrop of this great kingdom, of the Roman Empire bearing down on them, Jesus shows everyone that his kingdom is completely flipped, flipped upside down. Instead of going after power and domination and money and violence and oppression, the kingdom that Jesus brings is one of humility and service and peace and sacrifice and love. And we get that image made very clear on Good Friday when these two kingdoms clash. They collide with each other in one event. On one hand, the cross. The cross is the very symbol of the power and the might of the Romans. The cross was a particularly painful, particularly humiliating method of execution. This is in a day and age where, where cruel and unusual punishment was the point. It wasn't something to be avoided. They were making a very public point to anyone watching that if you even think about challenging the dominance and the might of the Romans, that this is how you're going to wind up. The cross is the symbol of the dominance of the Romans, enforced by the cruelest of violence. And at the same time, it is also the symbol of the establishment of the kingdom of God as well. The cross is also Jesus rejecting the use of violence in order to establish his kingdom here on earth. If the Romans established their kingdom by taking life and using violence, then Jesus establishes his kingdom by giving up his life. The cross is the establishment of the kingdom of heaven. And one of the central questions that it forces us to ask is which kingdom will we choose? Are we going to place our faith and our trust and allegiance, our worship, with the kingdoms and the empires of this world, or will we place them with the kingdom of God? Will we declare that Caesar is Lord, or that Jesus is Lord? Or to say it in more modern terms, are we going to campaign 
for the next political person to run for president, or are we going to campaign for Jesus for president? Will we hitch our wagons to the elephants and the donkeys, or to the Lamb of God? And the thing is, that the choice is relatively clear here. There really is very little comparison between the empires of this world and the kingdom of God. The empires of this world are built on taking from other people, extracting resources, demanding worship and allegiance, and creating divisions and enforcing their control by force and violence and domination. The kingdom of God, however, is built on humility and service, peace, sacrifice, nonviolence, love, and worship of God. These are not particularly compatible kingdoms. Now, all of this is to say that as Christians, we are called to be a part of God's kingdom. And if we are called to be a part of that kind of kingdom, then we must always remember that there is a great difference between the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God. And that that difference will put us at odds with the world around us. Do not ever forget, we're the weird ones, right? We're the strange ones. We're the ones who live by a whole different set of rules that the world can hardly make sense of. One of my favorite old-timey songs says, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. We brethren have a little tagline that we've used for quite a few years now which says that we are continuing the work of Jesus peacefully, simply, and together. In a world that is continuing the work of the empire, violently, extravagantly, and divided, that makes us strange. And the thing is, we are reminded of that strangeness through many of the rituals of our church and our traditions. Like I said at the beginning of our worship service, this week you were all invited to participate in a particularly strange ritual called Love Feast. It is a service, a worship service, where we reenact the Last Supper. We will share a common meal together as a community. We will share communion, reminding us of his death and resurrection. And we will wash each other's feet, an act which trains us in the way of humility service. And yes, if you have never been to this kind of service or you're just hearing about it for the first time, yes, this is weird. It is strange and you should totally come and check it out. It's strange because that's the point. Love Feast is weird because it invites us to become part of a kingdom that clashes with the kingdoms of this world. It invites us into another way of living that doesn't make sense to the rest of the world around us. As followers of Christ, we are called to be part of an upside-down kingdom. A kingdom which will make us very, very odd. Which is also very, very odd. Thanks for watching this video from the First Church of the Brethren in Wichita, Kansas. If you'd like to watch another video, click the link on the right. Thanks for liking, commenting, and subscribing on this video. And we'd love to have you join us on Sundays at 9.30 for Sunday School and 10.45 for worship. Everyone is welcome and you're invited.